Hi guys, module five is on the way. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, once again, just a very, very brief overview. If you've been following faithfully long, uh, then you know that uh, I don't do a whole lot of lecturing. Uh, I'll try to get what little bit of explanation is necessary in these videos. I don't do much in class, but the purpose here is just kind of point out to you things that you might need to pay special attention to for the exams and also to encourage you to watch the videos and to uh, go through the classwork. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to go ahead and go to the desktop. And here we are, Chapter 5, or Module 5, however you want to call it, Cabling. And this is going to be one of our more hands-on chapters. Cabling is a... <laughs> Basically, it's a hand-on business. Um, as wireless becomes more popular and reliable, of course, a lot of cabling is going by the wayside, but I don't believe it'll ever be completely done away with. I think that there's always going to be, or at least for the foreseeable future, there's going to be room for copper cabling because, frankly, it's just too reliable and it's too easy to set up, and there are too many things still with wireless that can cause interruptions or... Uh, loss of signal. So let's get started with cabling. Basically, as we do the module objectives, number one, explain the basic data transmission concepts, including frequency, bandwidth, throughput, multiplexing, and some of the common transmission flaws, things that can go wrong. Describe the physical characteristics of and the official standards for coax, twin ax, twisted pair, fiber optic, and their related connectors. Compare the benefits and limitations, as we just talked about, uh, wireless is good, but there's still some things that don't work exactly like we expect, and there's still a lot of things that can interfere. Finally, select and use the appropriate tools to troubleshoot common cable problems, and we're going to use in class uh, some testers. We're going to look at some network testers and some cable toners, things like that, that you will, if you should happen to choose employment in this field, and if you become a network technician, believe me, you will become very familiar with cable testers and toners. So with nothing else on that page. Let's get going here. Transmission techniques. Uh, this section covered measurements that indicate network efficiency, which you should be able to measure and obstacles to good network performance, some of the things that can interfere with our work. The vocabulary frequency is either megahertz or gigahertz. It's indicated the number of times an electrical system changes state. Bandwidth is the amount of data that could theoretically be transmitted during a given period of time. However, bandwidth and actual or uh, realistic bandwidth are often two different things. Throughput is how much data can be transmitted. Uh, this is actual transmit. This is, the, this is the realistic figure. Bandwidth is theoretical. Throughput is actual. New technologies such as modulation, encoding, etc., offer methods for increasing theoretical. But uh, there again, uh, you guys will see as you uh, as you advance in your careers that this is a this is a very frustrating thing. Sometimes uh, a client will say, "Hey, my bandwidth is supposed to be this, but my throughput is actually this. What's the deal?" And then you have to uh, you have to explain the difference. Flaws in transmission, noise that is undesirable, measured in decibels, and that is capable of degrading or distorting signal. Two common sources, EMI, electromagnetic interference. This can be motors, power lines, televisions, copiers, fluorescent lights, microwave ovens, hair dryers. Anything that you can think of that produces an electrical field can be a source of EMI. And then crosstalk, that's when one wire infringes on a, an adjacent wire. When you have two unshielded wires too close together, uh, alien crosstalk is between two cables. Near-end crosstalk occurs near the source and far end occurs at the far end of the cable. So you need to be familiar with those vocabulary words. Attenuation, as the signal moves away from the source, it gets weaker. That's why there is a maximum limit to the length of Cat5, Cat6, those kind of cables. Uh, the signal either has to be boosted by an amplifier of some kind in, uh, in line with the travel, or you just have to make the signal, the cable shorter. You can use a repeater that regenerates the signal, that's the amplifier I was talking about, and that will uh, extend the length that you can transmit. 
Latency is the time between the start and finish of the signal transmission, the delay between transmission and receipt. Uh, it can cause network transmission errors if the latency is too high, particularly if you've ever tried to play a uh, video game and the internet's busy or whatever, uh, your latency can kill you. Uh, we call it lag, but uh, lag is your worst enemy in most uh, video games, so that is, that is network latency. The length of the cable affects the amount of latency, as does the existence of intervening devices or objects. Generally, the intervening devices in the case of lag are other servers not going as fast as uh, you need them to go. Round trip time is the time for a packet to go from sender to receiver and back. And then uh, jitter, uh, packet delay variation, you need to understand what that means. Duplex, haplex, and simplex. NIC settings include the direction in which the signal travels over the median, the number of signals that can traverse at any time. Full duplex means signals can travel both ways simultaneously. Think of talking on a phone. If you're speaking to someone, they're speaking to you, then you don't have to pause while they speak, although it's polite. Uh, you can both speak at the same time and both still hear what the other is saying, even though you may be speaking at the same time. That means the signal's traveling both ways simultaneously. Half duplex means that the signal can travel both ways, but only in one direction at a time. Think of a walkie-talkie. You have to push the button. One party can speak while the other party is listening, but if both parties push the button at the same time, neither party can hear anything. So full duplex is like a phone, half duplex like a walkie-talkie, and then simplex. This is only one directional or unidirectional communication. Not much of that out there. It's not very efficient because that means only one party can talk to the other unless you have another wire coming back. And I'm not going to go through that. Multiplexing, a form of transmission that allows multiple signals to travel simultaneously over the same cable. Uh, you have to divide that channel into smaller channels or subchannels, and you use a MUX or multiplexer to do that. Uh, three types that use copper line, and I'll let you figure out those. Uh, just make sure you know the definitions because they will be on the quiz. Uh, fiber optics also has multiplexing. Once again, that information will be on the test, so make sure you're familiar with it. Coax cable. This is the old uh, television cable. Uh, got the shiny twisty ends on it, and it's usually a black uh, round cable. Uh, it was the foundation of the Ethernet networks back in the 80s. That used to be before the advent of Cat3, Cat5, Cat6. That was what was used to uh, create computer networks was coax cable. It has a central metal core surrounded by an insulator and then a braided metal shielding. And the two types of coax, RJ6 and RJ59, can use either a BNC or an F connector. That information will also be on the quiz. Twin ax cables look similar to coax, except instead of only one metal core, there are two. And they cooperate in half duplex fashion to transmit data. It can support a lot higher bandwidth or throughput than coax. Uh, I'll let you read about the, about the uh, qualifications, the requirements for twin ax. And also, um, I will let you uh, determine the distances. The distances are not very far for this kind of cable. And that's what a twin axe connector looks like. You probably won't see any of this unless you're specifically working in low voltage television signal. I doubt you'll ever see twin axe cable. Twisted pair you will see a lot of. You'll see it in this class and you'll see it everywhere you go because twisted pair, this is your Cat3, Cat5, Cat5e, Cat6, 7, 8, and 9. This is the network cable that you're used to. This is what we're using in this class right now. Twisted pair means there are four wire pairs for a total of eight wires. They're color-coded. Brown, white, brown, green, white, green, blue, white, blue, and uh, orange, white, orange. And that pattern of colors is what makes the cable work. And so it's very important, and we'll look at that a lot deeper in lab. Fast Ethernet uses one pair uh, to send data and one pair to receive. Networks using gigabit Ethernet use all four pairs. That only works with Cat6, Cat5e, or Cat6 and above. 
uh, Cat 3 and regular Cat 5 will not do gigabit. Shielded and unshielded, I'll let you figure that one out, but it has to do with whether there's a sheath of aluminum foil inside the plastic uh, that surrounds the cable. And that acts as a barrier to prevent EMI that we talked about a while ago. Effectiveness of the shield depends on the following, and I'll let you read this information. CAT-8 incorporate a much more effective and sophisticated shielding material uh, and a lot higher wire twists, which we'll talk about why the wire twists are important. And it can come close to fiber optics for short distances. And that's basically what you're looking at. Uh, you've got a plastic sheath, and then you may or may not have foil around the individual cables, and these are the twisted pairs. Green, white, green, blue, white, blue, orange, white, orange, and brown, white, brown. Okay, that's Cat 8. It's got uh, foil around the outside as well as foil around the individual pairs. This is very expensive cabling, but it's also very effective. UTP consists of one or more insulated wire pairs encased in a plastic sheath. Uh, it does not contain anything else but just that plastic sheath. It's less expensive and uh, unfortunately less effective than STP. However, it's more popular because uh, the price for STP is very expensive. That's unshielded twisted pairs. That's cable without the aluminum foil wrapped inside it. And basically, I'll let you read about the comparing and contrasting STP and UTP. And the pinouts, we're going to use 568B because that's what everybody uses. So when inserting the wires in the RJ45 plugs, you will need to use 568B. That is the pattern. Green, white, let's see, it's uh, orange, white, orange, blue, white, green, green, white, blue. So those are switched and then brown, white, brown. Those are switched, so that's the pattern that we will use. And there, let's see here. There is A and there's B. So you've got orange, white, orange, green, white, blue, blue, white, green, brown, white, brown. That's how we're going to uh, build our cables when we start building the cables here. And this is, uh, this is the color for B. This is the one we're looking at. This is what's going to uh, go over each wire. Transmission occurs over the uh, orange-white and the uh, orange. So those two provide going and coming gigabit uh, ethernet. Uh, the green-white-green, or the white-green uh, is a receiving cable. Blue's unused. White-blue's unused. Solid-green is a receiving and then white brown and brown uh, solid brown are unused so you need to be i would i would commit this cable or this uh chart to memory let's see straight through cables regular patch cables these are regular internet cables this is what you have connected to your systems right now these are the ones that run over to the uh to the switch in the corner just regular internet a rollover or crossover cables will allow you to connect uh to uh, a, a, a console port, rather, to a router. And uh, essentially what that does is it allows you to control the router, but it's not, a, it's not a data transmission cable. Basically, all the wires are reversed, and the terminations are mirror images of each other. That means they're opposite. They've crossed over. Uh, the, they're, they're orange, white, orange, green, white, blue, blue, white, green is actually brown, white, brown, green, white, green, blue, white, blue. It, it's swapped out. So we'll go more into detail in that and do crossover cables. Power over Ethernet allows you to send electric voltage as well as current, uh, pardon me, as well as signal over Internet. That means you can plug in uh, things like security cameras. You only have to have one cable that runs to them because then you can plug in the Ethernet cable and the camera will also get power. It can get 15.4 volts of power and uh, for the old standard and then 25.5 for the newer basically that will uh, that'll run the camera and so you don't have to have a separate cable carrying power to the camera you can just have uh, the ethernet cable which will bring the video signal back and it will also send power to the camera 
you've got to have Cat 5 or better, and uh, also you have to have special switches and power supplies to provide the power for that. And that's where you'd use it, is with a security camera. You've got a PoE security camera, you only have to have one cable from the switch, and then basically this allows you to uh, send power and receive video signal. Whereas with a non-POE security camera, you got to have a plug-in as well as a data. So you have to have two different cables coming out of the camera. It saves a lot of work just having one. Ethernet standards, I'll let you read those. And just be aware that that information will probably be on the quiz. Uh, what's the maximum segment for Ethernet networks? And that would be 100 meters. If you go beyond about 300 feet, what's going to happen is... Uh, the signal will become so weak at the other end of the cable, at the far end of the cable, that the computer or switch or whatever that's, that's receiving it won't be able to decipher it. It, uh, it doesn't have enough voltage to, uh, to work with the NIC card, with the network adapter card, and so attenuation just basically bleeds off your power, and you, your signal just is not strong enough to be read, and so you'll start having network issues. Fiber optic, that is sending, uh, instead of uh, voltage, you're sending pulses of laser uh, or LED along a, a, a glass fiber. Surrounding the fiber uh, is a layer of glass called cladding. It's less dense than the glass or plastic that, ref that, uh, that is actually carrying the signal, and so it reflects the signal back. And what it does is it allows the uh, it allows the cable to bend without refracting and, and degrading the signal. Outside the cladding, there's usually plastic wrapped around it to keep it from uh, number one. It uh, keeps light from escaping, so you don't lose your signal, and uh, it also allows for bending around corners and things like that, and, and pr protecting the cable itself. Usually, Kevlar or some kind of uh, polyfiber and uh, that's what it looks like if you look very carefully these are not wire these are glass it is capable of extremely high throughput it's also very resistant to noise because it's light it's not uh, electric it's not electromagnetic so EMI doesn't affect it really good security you can't use a uh, you can't use a toner or a, or a cable sniffer uh, to hack uh, a fiber optic network and you can carry your signals for a lot longer distance it's expensive and it does require special equipment especially to splice it when you start terminating fiber optic cables the equipment is fairly expensive single mode fiber I'll let you read that part and also uh, multi-mode I'll let you read those fiber connectors um, talk about ultra polished and angle polished well, uh, we probably won't. We will not in this class work with any fiber. Number one, it's expensive. Number two, it's fairly complicated. It's a whole class unto itself. When you start talking about terminating fiber cables, when you start talking about running fiber, uh, that's a thing that you will learn um, in a little bit, a little further on down the road. Media converters. This converts fiber, the uh, light signals in fiber, to voltage. So when we're talking earlier in the year about uh, the LMFs for a network where the, where the backbones come in, usually the backbones are fiber, and there is a converter there that takes that fiber signal and turns it into uh, a, a signal that copper wire can carry. It turns it into voltage. So that's what a media converter does. Fiber transceivers, I'll let you read those, but you do need to be familiar with the different types. A <laughs> I love that word. Uh, it's a transceiver designed for gigabit Ethernet connectors, and I'll just let you uh, go from there. You've got to make sure they're paired properly with the right protocols and speeds. You're using the right kind of cable because there are a lot of different ones. Uh, Ethernet standards, I will let you go through that one on your own. It's also in the book. Common fiber problems. Generally, this is a big one. Fiber type mismatch. You have two different contractors, they buy different materials because they didn't read the specs, and now they can't get them to connect. Wavelength mismatches, you have different kind of lights, you have different kind of transmitters. Dirty connectors is probably the most common. Per, uh, the person who uh, terminates the fiber cables, 
if they allow those cables to have a little grease, like even finger, uh, like hand grease, the, the, the grease off your fingers will do it. And that's all it takes. If you get that on that fiber, that glass cable, it's, you might as well cut it off and start over again because it's not going to work. Cable troubleshooting tools. Uh, you can look at, we'll actually look at uh, copper meters in here. We won't look at any fiber meters because frankly they're expensive and this class is not that concerned with fiber, but we will look at quite a few copper uh, tools, things that you can measure and make sure that your cables are, first of all, that the pairs are aligned right, and second of all, that there aren't any breaks and the signal is transmitting as it should. Toner and probe kits, that's the tools that we'll be using, and we will use them quite a bit when we're making our cables. A multimeter, not so much, but you can use a multimeter to determine if a cable is shorted or uh, if there's an open circuit, things like that. Uh, we'll talk about multimeters, but we probably won't use them. Frankly, with the advent of simple cable testers, multimeters kind of, uh, they're a lot, it's like using a cannon to kill a house fly. There's too much uh, stuff there. You don't need to know resistance, voltage, impedance, all that stuff, just to know if a cable's working. So it's a lot easier to plug in the tester on each end, turn it on, and make sure that the lights light up like they're supposed to. Continuity testers basically just determine that the, uh, the uh, cable from start to finish is conductive. And uh, performance testers, basically they measure uh, all the different possibilities that can go wrong. TDR, time domain reflectometer, I'll let you read that. You need to know these definitions. Uh, this is for fiber optics and optical power meter. Just determines that the light at the end of the cable is bright enough to work. All right, what tool could you use to test a twisted pair's pinout? And that's going to be a uh, continuity tester because it will tell you it lights up. It has eight LEDs on it, and they light up in the proper order to tell you that the uh, cable is built correctly. All right, so summary, as we do, this is what you should have learned or what you, what you should know by the end of this module. The basic data transmission concepts, you need to know frequency, bandwidth, throughput, multi and uniplexing, and uh, EMI and things like that, the different flaws. Uh, describe the physical characteristics and official standards for coax, twin x, twisted pair, fiber optics, and the different connectors, in this case, really RJ45. Compare the benefits and limitations of uh, basically between uh, the different kinds of copper as well as fiber optics. As, then select and use the appropriate tool to troubleshoot. That's going to be mainly for copper. That's going to be mainly continuity testers and toners. Okay, guys, I hope you're enjoying this class so far. Uh, if you have any questions, once again, Thursday night is the night. Also, if you happen to be on campus during the day, I'm on the second floor of the library in room 210, kind of by the back stairs. So uh, I am I am available for you, uh, unless I'm doing something else. But uh, give me a holler. Also, make sure that you're communicating, that you're uh, keeping up with the quizzes. Just to let you know, or just to reiterate, here's how this works. Uh, we try to get two labs done a night on Thursdays. That's going to get us finished way, way, way quicker than what the class is going to run. So I'm not going to hold you to come into class every Thursday night once you're done. Once you have all the labs completed successfully and you're happy with your grade, then I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to hold you to coming to class every night. However, what I am going to hold you to is making sure that you are getting weekly these tests done. That's the thing that counts for your attendance. Uh, you have a test turned in, you have a homework assignment turned in, that's where you get your attendance grade from. If you do not have the necessary attendance touches for the, the Canvas class, it will cost you grade points at the end of the class. Which, uh, all that material is in the, in the uh, syllabus. So make sure that you are coming, <laughs> coming to class. Also, that's important because you've got to get these labs done, but make sure that you are coming to the Canvas uh, class logging in and doing some work weekly make sure you stay caught up because uh, number one these classes 
uh, the quizzes become invisible after a certain amount of time. And number two, you don't want to try to cram 10 or 12 quizzes, quizzes toward the end. Now, I will let you work ahead to a certain extent, but not. Um, I'm not going to let you finish the whole class the first couple of weeks. So you should probably already know that by now. I'm just reiterating. Anyway, let me know if you have questions. Remember the Canvas inbox and uh, also uh, keep caught up and I hope everything is going well for you. Have a good day.